Hey y'all, my name is Prashanth Kumar, or PK, and I'm an MCAT tutor at Shamassian Academic Consulting. Today, we're going to be taking on a chem phys passage on the MCAT and figuring out some strategies, some tips, some tricks to help you tackle this section. Usually, you want to take roughly eight minutes on each of these passages, but today we're going to be going more in depth so you can see what's going on in my head and some strategies to help you tackle this section. Let's get it. All right, let's get right into it. So I put the passage on the left side and all five questions we're going through on the right side. So feel free to pause the video here, go through the questions at your own pace and come back. But if not, let's get right into it. So for most of the science passages, I have the same exact strategy. Um, I go paragraph by paragraph, sort of give it a quick read of each paragraph, then write three to five words on my little notebook. Um, just as a quick check-in of the main idea of what's going on, then go on to the next paragraph, continue all the way through. The reason I really like this strategy is it provides accountability for you when you're going through this passage, whatever passage comes up. I often found myself getting lost, like after the first two paragraphs, I didn't understand a detail or two or a word or two, and that set the tone for the entire passage, and that's terrible. We can't have that, because then you start reading words, you're not understanding, and then you get lost and don't understand what the entire passage is saying and have to reread it all over again. And that wastes a lot of time. I like this three to five word summary because it's like a quick check in every single step, making sure I understand what's going on. I'm ready to move on to the next paragraph and it saves a lot of time. The next thing is figures will always come up in these types of sections. So I try to actually ignore the figures, the first read, maybe I'll look at it for a second, but Nothing too extensive, not, a quick, not more than a quick glance. The reason for this being the questions that are asked about the figures will make you eventually probably come back to the figures. So obviously not perfect for everyone, but I really think it's not super helpful to go through the figures the first time, especially when A, you don't know what it's asking for, like what part of the figure is important, but also B, what happens if a question doesn't even ask about the figure? Do we want to waste time looking at a figure that might not be important to the rest of the questions? No, we want to save as much time as possible. So that's why I think that the, the strategy is perfect. So let's go right through the passage. So first, in a college laboratory experiment, students were asked to complete a titration experiment with acetic acid as analyte and sodium hydroxide as titrant. To conduct the experiment, 100 milliliters of 0.2 molar NaOH was added to a burette. 50 milliliters of acetic acid of unknown concentration was added to an Erlenmeyer flask and placed beneath the burette. Students were asked to determine the concentration of the provided acetic acid, pKa equals 4.7. So the question I'm asking myself is, what is going on in this paragraph? Nothing too crazy, not focused on the details, but what is happening? And right away, my mind goes to titration, right? This is something I've studied before and something that is talking about is we have a titration and what type of titration do we have? Well, we have acetic acid and sodium hydroxide. So I'm gonna write a weak acid, strong base titration, right? This is a type of titration we probably studied about a little bit, but that's that basic idea. Nothing too detailed. I'm not focused on values, molarities, whatever. Just basic idea of what's happening. Takes two seconds. So let's go on to the next paragraph. One of the students generates the following titration curve while completing the assignment experiment. And then it gives us a graph. I, again, not gonna focus too much on it. I see that it's a curve, like a titration curve we've probably seen before, but I'm gonna wait till a question asks for it and then come back to it. So really short passage. So I think we're ready to go right into the questions. And so this is the first question, great. Approximately how many moles of NaOH were present in the burette at the equivalence point of the student's titration? 0 0.03, 0 0.029, 0 0.014, or 0 0.01 moles? So right away I asked myself, what's the question asking for? We got moles of NaOH, we've got in the burette at the equivalence point. So we've got, we're asking for moles of NaOH in a specific spot at the equivalence point. Great, so let's break it down into what we know. From our knowledge of titrations and what we've studied before from our content phase, we should know that the equivalence point is at a specific part of a curve that we've seen before, right? And it's easy to understand that we have to go back to the figure 
because this is sort of, it gives us information and we have to apply that information to what we know, right? So let's go to our figure. We need to find the equivalence point. And where would the equivalence point be? Well, from our knowledge, we know that the equivalence point is at the steepest part of this um, titration curve, right? It's like this sigmoidal curve, I think it's called. And this, we're looking for the steepest part, which is roughly around here, right? And so that is where the equivalence point will be. And the MCAS not testing whether we can determine whether it's 28 milliliters versus 27 and a half milliliters or a pH of 8.9 and 9. We're not worried about those minute differences. A rough approximation, pretty much where it is, and the MCAT should give you good values to work with because you don't have a calculator, right? And so here we have a 28 milliliters at a pH of 9 is where our equivalence point is. Great. And so 28 milliliters of NaOH, and make sure we focus on that X axis, right? It says 28 milliliters of NaOH added, right? Great. And so we have that part set. And now the question's asking for in the burette. And so we need to understand what's going on in this titration, right? And so I'm gonna draw a little diagram of what exactly is going on. And forgive me for drawing, I am not great at art, but this is basically what your titration looks like in a lab that we've probably seen in Orgo or Biochem, um, is that you have this little thing that you turn, drips liquid into this other thing, and that's what you have. So in this case, right, we have the burette, and it says we start with 100 milliliters of NaOH there, right? That's what we start with in the burette. And then we have our acetic acid in the Erlenmeyer flask, right? And so this is what's going on. And so now we have to say if 28 milliliters of NaOH are added to our acetic acid solution, how many are left, right? We start with 100, we lose 28. Simple math tells us 100 minus 28, we got 72 milliliters left, right? So that's how many milliliters we have left in NaOH. But now the question is not asking us for milliliters, right? It's asking us for moles of NaOH. So how do we get from 72 milliliters of NaOH to moles of NaOH? Well, we need to use molarity, right? That's the unit that helps us convert from milliliters or volume to moles. And this is a type of problem we'll see over and over again, right? And so it's a dimensional analysis where we start with 72 milliliters, right? And we want to get to moles using moles per liter or molarity. So we need to get to liters first, right? And so how do we get from milliliters to liters? Well, we know that there are a thousand milliliters in one liter, right? And then how do we get from liters to moles? We use molarity, right? And we saw on the problem that we have a 0.2 molar solution right there and a 0.2 molar solution. So it's 0.2 moles per liter. Great. And so we have set it up where the units cancel out, right? And we are left with moles. Great. So how do we do this? Math on the MCAT sometimes very annoying. So I like to break it up into two parts, right? I like to break it up in sort of the numerical part and then also the power of 10 part or like the, um, the sort of beyond the numbers. And you'll, you'll see what I mean by that in a second. So I like to multiply sort of the numbers part. So we have 72 times two, right? That's the basic idea. I know it says 0.2 and we're dividing by 1,000, but before we do that, what is 72 times 2, right? And you can write it down on your little notebook. 72 times 2 is 144, right? So we're focused on the 144, and then we'll focus on the magnitude after that, right? So right away, we know that the numbers will have a 1 or 1, 4 in there. So we can actually eliminate A and B, right? Because A is 0 0.03 and B is 0 0.029. C and D have this 0 0.01 and 0 0.014. So let's make sure we have our orders of magnitude correct, right? So when we do 72 times 0 0.2, right? Then we have to put this decimal down here, right? One place over. Now we have 14.4 divided by 1,000. And how do we do that? Well, we just jump back three spots, right? That when you divide by 1,000, your decimal point goes to the left three spots. And if you multiply by 1,000, it would go to the right three spots. So in this case, we're left with 0 0.0144, or our best answer is 0 0.014 moles, right? And we could have probably picked that immediately based on 72 times 2 and not worried about like the magnitude of powers of 10, 
But just to be clear, I like doing the math out just so I don't make any silly errors. So 72 times 2 divided by 1,000 um, times, or 0.2 divided by 1,000, you get to 0 0.014. Awesome. So that, that's it. We did one, we're one for one. Let's go on to question two. Let's do this. Question two, all right? How many grams of NaOH were added to 100 milliliters of water to create the solution used in the titration, right? So we want to get from milliliters of water to grams of NaOH, right? And how can we do this? Well, we can use molarity again, right? If we have the, the volume per se, and then we jump through from volume to sort of molarity, we can get to moles. And then how do we get from moles to grams? We use the molar mass, right? That's the very important thing. So let's do it, right? So again, we said that we have uh, 0.2 moles per liter or uh, 0.2 molar solution, right? So I usually just write that, whoops. I write it out, 0.2 moles of NaOH per liter, right? And then we know that we have 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters of water, right? So right away, we are left with that in terms of the liters cancel out. Great. So now we have that. And now we want to go from moles of NaOH to grams of NaOH, right? And this is where we have to do the molar mass, right? We'll have moles of NaOH here and grams of NaOH here, OK? Does this make sense so far? Great. So when we look at this, we have to pull out our best friend, the periodic table, right? And this is where it's super helpful to be comfortable with the periodic table, the abbreviations, like val like numbers and values that you'll see on um, the abbreviations. And so let's start with NaOH, right? Na, O, and H. And we're looking for the masses of each of these um, atoms, right? Na has a mass of 23 right here. O has a mass, mass of 16, and H has a mass of 1. And so if we add them all up, we get 23 plus 16 plus 1, which is 40 grams per mole, right? So now we have everything we need. All we do is run one mole of NaOH is 40 grams of NaOH. And so if we look at the sort of units that cancel out, oops, did not mean to do that, the moles of NaOH will cancel with the moles of NaOH, and we're left with grams of NaOH, and we are thriving. So again, how do we get from um, this point, like from moles to grams? Well, we do dimensional analysis, just like last problem. And what we used, what was the trick we used on the last problem? Well, we focused on the magnitude before we, or the value, the numerical part before we focused on the magnitude, right? So here we have a two times a one times a 40. So we're gonna be roughly somewhere with an eight in it, right? Two times 40, 80, right? So we have that. And so if we just see that it has eight, we can eliminate B, C, and D pretty easily and have A, but let's just do the math out, right? Um, what is 0.2 times 40? Well, that's eight. And then times 0.1, we jump that back again, and then we have 0.8, and that's exactly what our answer is. You could do it, I like to multiply sort of the tens out so the decimals are easier to work with and then multiply the parts. But do whatever works for you, write it out, whatever is easy. But become comfortable with multiplying decimals, multiplying um, numbers out, whether you have to put it in scientific notation, whether you're just naturally gifted at multiplying decimals out, whatever works for you. We don't wanna make silly errors with these types of things because we've gotten so far and we're so close to solving the problem already. A silly math error would ruin it, but Let's go on to the next question. Great. Question number three. All right. What is the approximate ratio of HA to A minus at the equivalence point of the titration? All right. So ratio of HA to A. Hmm. Something should be ringing in our head. There should be bells ringing. What formula are we thinking of right now? We are thinking of our friend Henderson Hasselbach, right? I hope I write his name correctly, but Henderson Hasselbach. This is the important formula that has the sort of ratio of H and HA, or A to HA that we always see. And so the equation, I'll write it out, is pH 
equals pKa plus log of the concentration of A minus over HA. Great, okay? So we have this sort of setup. We have this equation. It's memorized in our head. We write it on paper. The way I always like to remember it, because a lot of people get confused with whether it's A over HA, HA over A, whether it's positive in front, is I'll remember it's like pH equals pKa, and then plus log aha. A over HA, I like to say aha, like you're laughing or you're like epiphany moment. And aha is like laughing, be positive, like think positive. So you'll have a positive sign before the aha. I know, silly, help me remember it. Doesn't have to make sense to anyone else other than me. But I think that's just a silly, like fun way to help memorize things. So if you can come up with ways that'll help you remember these formulas and keep like the A over HA positive sign in your head, you'll be golden. Great. So now let's go through our numbers. What, what can we plug in? That's, the, that's what we want to start with. Well, it's saying pH at the equivalence point, right? So what is the pH at the equivalence point? Well, we solved this before. We said this was 9, right? And now what is the pKa value? Well, we are actually given that in the passage, right? If we look here, it says the pKa of acetic acid is 4.7. Great. So right away, we have values that we plugged in. Um, we don't know the, the A concentration or the HA concentration because that's what we're looking for. Remember, that's what the question's asking for. But right away, we have two things we plugged in. And how do we go about algebra usually? We put the numbers on one side and the variables on the other side. So what is 9 minus 4.7? Math tells us that it is 4.3 equals the log of concentration of A minus over HA, HA, great. And so right away, I mean, this is pretty early on, but if we needed to eliminate anything, I'd probably eliminate 10 to 3.3 and negative 3.3, because they're probably expecting us to make a silly error with our math or something. But let's continue with the problem and check if that sort of intuition makes sense. Well, how do we get rid of a log? Well, we have to raise both sides to the 10th power. So we put a 10 under there. We're left with 10 to the 4.3 equals A minus over HA, right? Okay, great. So now we have 10 to the 4.3. But what is the question asking for? Well, it's asking for the ratio of HA to A minus. So what have we written here? A over HA. But we want HA over A, right? That's what the question's asking for. How do we do this? Well, we just flip it, right? This turns into HA over A equals 1 over 10 to the 4.3. And based on our logic, our knowledge of exponents, and maybe this was even on the SAT back in the day, this is equal to 10 to the negative 4.3, right? Our values, when we have 1 over something to the exponent, it's that, that's just the negative exponent of it. So right away we have our answer and our intuition was right, so we'll stick with 10 to the negative 4.3. But again, this, all it required was under, remembering one formula and plugging in sort of the values it's given to solve it. Nothing too crazy other than exponents and intuition. So that's all we did. Let's go. So that is the question number three. We're three for three, we're crushing it, our math skills are out of the park right now or out of this world and we are on to question number four okay so by how many orders of magnitude is the concentration of acetic acid after the student has added 28 milliliters of NaOH greater than the concentration of acetic acid after the student has added 14 milliliters of NaOH 6 10 to the 6 10 to the 7th and 7th Okay, so we have a lot of words here. I'm gonna to try to focus on what I think is important, right? The question's asking us for orders of magnitude, right? That's the first and foremost important thing. And it's asking us concentration of acetic acid after 28 milliliters of NaOH or versus concentration of acetic acid after 14 milliliters of NaOH. So we're comparing two values after 28 milliliters of NaOH and after 14 milliliters of NaOH. Now the question is how many orders of magnitude, okay? And so we have two different things. We have this sort of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, 6 and 7. 
all right? So this is actually a great distinction, right? We have to determine the distinction between sort of this ratio of what the concentrations will be versus the orders of magnitude the concentrations will be. So having this understanding is very important, and we'll see this as we look at both of our values, right? 14 milliliters and 28 milliliters. It's actually been pretty nicely labeled in our figure, right? We looked at the 28, and we said we have a pH of 9. And then if we look at 14, what is this? Each dot, each grid box is 1, so we're at a pH of 2, right? So we have a pH difference of 7. The delta pH equals 7. And what do we know? The difference in pH represents the order of magnitude. That is a fact of pHs, right? The pHs are written as orders of magnitude. When you're taking the log term, right, that's when you get the orders of magnitude. Note, a lot of people might say that the answer is 10 to the 7th, but that is not orders of magnitude. That is the ratio of these concentrations, which is incorrect. The question is asking us for orders of magnitude, so our answer is D not C. And I like to think about this generally. When you're thinking of orders of magnitude, you're usually going to think of numbers like uh, two times order of magnitude or three times order of magnitude greater, not like 10 to the seventh order of magnitude greater, although that could be the case. But orders of magnitude, we know pH is written in these terms of orders of magnitude already. So that is why D is our answer, not C. C is giving us the ratio of these values. Hopefully that makes sense, and we are four for four. On to the next question. Last question, question five. We get this perfect score on the, the chem phys section. We're one step closer to that 528. Let's go. Question five. Assume that instead of acetic acid, formic acid, pK of 3.7, of the same concentration were used in this experiment. How would this affect the pH of the equivalence point? Equivalence point would increase, equivalence point would decrease, no change, either A or C. So what is the change that's happening, right? We're substituting acetic acid for formic acid. And what's the difference? Well, we see that the pKa's are different, right? We had a 4.7 pKa for acetic acid, and now we have a pKa of 3.7. What do we know about pKa and sort of how strong an acid is? That's the first question we should be asking, right? Well. Uh, we should know that a lower pKa means that you have a higher Ka value, right? And I guess also vice versa, right? An increased pKa means that you have a lower Ka value. This is similar to pH, right? pH and pKa, the lower you are, the higher you're like in the whatever the H or the Ka that you're running the P on, uh, the negative log on will be higher, right? So in this case, a decreased pK means a greater Ka, and an increased pKa means a lower Ka. What does a greater Ka value mean? Well, we should know that a greater Ka value means that the acid dissociates easier, so we have a stronger acid, okay? And same thing here, if we had a lower pKa or a lower Ka value, we'd have a weaker acid. Perfect. Now, we, should, we see we have a pKa of formic acid that's 3.7 versus the 4.7 originally. So lower pKa value means a higher Ka value. We're working with a stronger acid, right? That's what we're working with right here. Not a weaker acid, a stronger acid. Perfect. So if we have a stronger acid, right, how does this affect the pH of the equivalence point? And currently, we're using sort of this weak acid and a strong base. And our, if we think about it, as we add more and more base, right, we're getting closer to the base's, constant, or the base's pH. Um, in this case, we get past sort of 7. We're in the 7 through 10 area, so we're in 9, right? Strong base will be stronger than the weak acid and overtake it eventually. Now, if we add a stronger acid, it's going to be harder for that base to overtake this, um, this, the pH of the acid, right? And we'll get closer and closer to seven, right? So our pH at the equivalence point should be lower. So that is why B is our answer, right? And if you think about this, let's think about the extremes. We know if we have a strong acid and a strong base titration, what will the pH be? It'll be seven, right? Because that's the factor of where like they dissociate equally, right? At seven. If we have a stronger uh, acid, or we have a weak acid and a strong base, we'll be 
more in the basic region. And then if we have a stronger acid that's in between this like super strong acid but the uh, and the weak acid, right? It'll be closer to seven, not that close to the base, but not seven. So it'll be lower than like strong base, weak acid, but um, greater than strong acid, strong base. So it'll be between the seven and nine in this case. So the equivalence point we'd decrease. And there we are. We have question B or question five B five for five. Let's go. We crushed it. And hopefully that was a super helpful chem phys passage. We got a lot of practice with math formulas, but also understanding titrations. And we love titrations because they are going to be on the MCAT or they could be on the MCAT. So great work, everyone. And we'll see you back next time. Great work, everyone. Another ChemPhys passage in the books. We're one step closer to that 528. I can feel it. Uh, keep it up. If you like this video, give us a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future MCAT videos. Go check out our 528 series for more high yield strategies as you get ready for the test. And make sure you sign up in the link in our bio for daily questions sent to you for the MCAT so you don't miss out on any practice before test day. Happy studying.